For the first time, I am on a quest with Minnie Morbid. <coughs> Say hi. Hi. So Maggie, today I'm talking about some naughty guys. Hi. What happens when people are naughty? I don't know. You don't know? Hi, I'm talking. Uh, are you ever naughty? I don't know. You don't know if you're ever naughty? Hey, you can be from school as I will say. Oh, okay. All right, well, let's go see where these guys were naughty, okay? Okay. Okay. Hello, all of my history loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures, and today we are returning to a fan favorite, Depression-era gangsters. Today we're going to talk about Adam Reschetti, who was a known associate of Pretty Boy Floyd. He traveled with him doing crimes the entire summer of 1933. We are going to visit Reschetti's grave today, and we are also going to go to the dealership where Floyd and Reschetti kidnapped Polk County Sheriff Big Jack Killingsworth in June of 1933. We're also going to be visiting Jack Killingsworth's grave. So let's get started talking about Sheriff Killingsworth's joyride with two notorious gangsters. I'm here at the grave of Adam Reschetti. I want to just tell you a little bit about his life before we get started on exactly what happened here in Bolivar in 1933. Okay, this is a new thing I've been doing where I kind of sit on the grave or by, I'm by the stone of who I'm talking about and talk about their life. So Adam Reschetti was not a great criminal. Honestly, I really haven't covered any great criminals yet. Adam was Born in 1909 in Strawn, Texas. By age 14, Adam Reschetti was an alcoholic. And it sounds like that problem plagued him his entire life. But he didn't break the law until he was 19 when he held up a store in Crown Point, Indiana. He was quickly caught and sentenced to one to 10 years in a juvenile facility, which he ended up doing two years and then was freed. Two years after getting out of the juvenile facility, he robbed his first bank. On March 9th, 1932, Adam Reschetti, Fred Hamner, and Blackie Smalley robbed the first national bank in Mill Creek, Oklahoma. Fred and Blackie went inside the bank to rob it while Adam stayed in the getaway car. Things did not go well. Not only did the teller managed to set off a silent alarm, but all of the citizens were also on bank robbery watch. All of the armed citizens came out and started shooting, and they killed Fred. They hit him right in the head. Blackie was also hit in the head and gravely wounded. Adam was in the car. When he saw all of this going south, he started driving. He was shot three times, and uh, after a few miles, he was caught. They saw him driving erratically. He had lost so much blood that the car just almost drifted to a stop with him passing out from blood loss. He had been shot in the left arm, one of his legs, I'm not sure if it was the left or the right, and in the neck. They took him to the Sulphur Sanitarium where he was hospitalized for two weeks to recover. Blackie was also put in there at the time. Blackie's brother was also in that hospital with tuberculosis, but it doesn't sound like he had anything to do with the robbery. They were given prison time for this. They were convicted in August. Adam was sent to McAllister State Prison, served about four months, which is a shockingly short time for bank robbery. I've also heard he jumped bail so maybe that is what it was. He got out on bail after serving four months and then ran. And sometime after that, he meets Pretty Boy Floyd. On his own, Rochetti wasn't a great criminal. Because of his severe alcoholism, I'm not even sure why Floyd thought it was worth it to team up with such a raging alcoholic. I would think he would have been a liability. But after they met, they hit it off great, and they started doing things together. Right before they arrived here on June 8th, they robbed a bank together in Mexico, Missouri. They got $1,600 from that job. Then they stole a car in Castle, Oklahoma, and drove here to Bolivar. I'm assuming to take shelter with Joe. 
Joe Reschetti was Adam Reschetti's older brother. He'd been born in 1899, so at this time he's about 31 or 32 years old, and he was a fabulous mechanic. He had been hired on full-time at Bitzer's Garage. The car they had stolen was a Pontiac, and maybe they didn't take great care of it because the sheriff said when he saw it, it had a dented front fender. It was absolutely covered in mud, as if they had been driving it really, really fast on country roads, which they probably had. For some reason, the car broke down. And a farmer came across them, and having no idea who he's talking to, he tows them into town, right to Bitzer's. I'm sure Adam Reschetti requested it, because he knew his brother worked there, and they must have been on their way to Bolivar to hide out with Joe. Joe had helped his brother before, not always willingly. After a bank robbery in Ash Grove, Missouri, about a year before, Adam had come with his accomplices, and hit out with Joe, and they gave him $300 of the loot. So here they are again. Brother needs help. Joe gets to work on the car. It's really early in the morning, 6 a.m., 6.30. And as they're doing this, the sheriff is having breakfast with his wife. I'm here at the grave of Big Jack Killingsworth, the sheriff of Polk County in 1933. Here's his wife, Bernice. Big Jack, he's actually listed as William here. He was a World War I veteran. He was a little older than her. He was born in 1897 versus her 1907. But that morning, they were sitting at the table having breakfast, and they had a conversation about whether or not he should take their two-year-old son, Jack, who's right here, with him on doing his rounds. Well, he was still asleep, so luckily Bernice said, no, please don't do that. Let's let him sleep. So he went alone, thankfully. I'm right here across from the Polk County Jail. I don't know if I can film a jail or not. But that would have been where the sheriff's house was, Sheriff Killingsworth. So right now, we are starting on the sheriff's rounds. I can show you exactly why the dealership would have been the first place he stopped. As the mother of a three-year-old, I can't imagine taking a two-year-old on your rounds like this. I tell you, my daughter would have none of it. The sheriff would have arrived here within 15 minutes or so, maybe even less, of leaving his house. Normally, he would have gone inside the dealership and said, Hey, how you doing? Hung out with his old friends. He used to sell cars here. But this morning, he sees there's a commotion down the street at Bitzer's garage just behind the dealership. He doesn't have a gun on him. Whether he just accidentally left it behind or never carried one, I'm not sure. Around 7.15 in the morning, Killingsworth arrived here at this garage. He was drawn to the garage because a big crowd had gathered because they knew who they were. Everyone knew Adam because he had lived in Bolivar for a time. The sheriff knew him. Well, because Adam knew him, the second he saw him, he knew, hey, that's the law. According to the paper, this is the Kansas City Star, Adam Reschetti took this crowd of people and lined them up against the wall. I guess trying to control the situation, he had a machine gun on him. And then when the sheriff comes in, things get really crazy. And Adam Reschetti goes up to the sheriff with the gun pointed right at him. And Joe, who is really good friends with the sheriff, steps in between them. And he says, Adam, if you're going to shoot the sheriff, you are going to have to shoot me. Floyd calls him off. Listen, put the gun away. We're not hurting anybody. He goes up to the sheriff and he says, Look, buddy, you're going to have to help us get out of this. I'm afraid you're just going to have to come with us. He asked him if he knows the roads, if he can help him get out of town. So he asked, Okay, where do you want to go? He said, We want to go to Kansas City. He said, Okay, head north. 
It took about 45 minutes for them to figure out what they were going to do. First, they needed to figure out transportation. They needed another car. The one they'd stolen still wasn't fixed. They see Joe's brand new car parked across the street, which is probably about where I'm standing right now. They go, they get it, they move their weapons over into it, they make the sheriff get in the back seat, they fill it with gas, and they take off. Worry not, I think Joe gets his car back. For the first 35 miles, Adam Rochetti drove, but he was drinking. He had a mason jar full of something, some sort of hooch or whiskey that he was swigging from, and as time went on, he was not safe to be driving. So Floyd switched, Rochetti got in the back seat and promptly passed out or went to sleep. Killingsworth said he was extremely impressed by Floyd's driving. He said he was really great about taking obscure back roads that would make him hard to follow. He was a, just a great driver in general. At one point when the law got on their tail, Floyd put a gun in inside and said to wave them off, which he said I gladly did. I had no problem doing that. He felt that law enforcement actually endangered his life by chasing after them. He said if you had just left them alone, I would be fine. He only felt in danger when the, the law got right on their tail because at that point he was worried about getting killed in a shootout, which is very true. When I covered Reed Spring with Bonnie and Clyde and they had that man in their car, he very easily could have been killed in that shootout. Because they went on such back roads, it's really hard to know exactly what their route was. Probably the sheriff couldn't even tell you, although he was familiar with all of those back roads around the Bolivar region. But in general, they head north, and around the time they get to Osceola, it's really hot. And they're thinking, we've got to change out of this car. On Highway 52, they pull in behind a car, they go around it, and then they block the road so that this man, William Griffith, has to stop. Griffith works in real estate. They say, hey man, I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to ride along with you for a little while. They all climb into Griffith's car, so now he is a prisoner too. At first, Griffith said he did not know that Sheriff Killingsworth was a sheriff. He actually thought he might have been one of the bandits. So that makes me think he's definitely in street clothes and is not recognizable as an officer. As they're going along though, he manages to tell Griffith, hey, I'm a prisoner too. I'm the sheriff of Polk County. Well, they keep driving and Killingsworth talks with Floyd. As they're talking, he blames his predicament on the police. He says the first time he ever went to prison, it was for something he hadn't done. It was a robbery or something. He served time for that. And then when he got out, he alleges the police never left him alone. Now this exact same thing happened to Clyde Barrow. After he went to jail, and then when he got out of Eastham, they never left him alone. They would go into his job. They would yank him out for questioning. And I mean literally for any crime that happened, he was questioned for it. Whether there was any evidence he was involved or not. It was, it was a harassment. I think they wanted him to leave town. So maybe this was a, a tactic that the police used regularly because Floyd is alleging the same thing and he said it got to the point they wouldn't let me go straight so I finally just said fine I will embrace the criminal lifestyle because that's the only option you're leaving me to make a living now again as with Clyde Barrow you could always pack up and move but then again it's the Great Depression moving is expensive and maybe that's not an option for everybody so he turned to crime full-time and blames the police for it. Well, Killingsworth comes back and says, Look, I've not done anything to you. I just want to go home to my little boy. Floyd says, I hardly ever get to see my little boy. He said, I see him maybe once or twice a year, always on the run. He just got a little wistful thinking about his family and how he couldn't be with them. I don't know if Killingsworth had a sympathy for Floyd. I don't know. But when they finally let him and Griffith go, and what they do is they, hi they, they get another car for themselves, and then they leave Griffith's car with him. I think they, have, they put it to where they had to look for it a little bit, but they did manage to find it pretty quickly. He let them off somewhere near Lee's Summit around the Kansas City area. 
They found the car, and when he got access to a telephone, he did not call authorities. He called his wife to tell her where he was, that he was fine, and he was questioned about this later. Why didn't you call the police? And he basically said, I had been instructed by the bandits that I would not do so. And given that he lived in Bolivar, near Rachetti's family, they would know where he lived, and to protect his family, he made the choice to do what he was told. And he did not actually interview with anybody until several days later when a Kansas City officer or detective came down to speak with him about the case. And then he started talking and giving specifics. On June 17th, Jack Killingsworth wrote an article in the newspaper about his experiences. And I just want to read to you what his opinion was of Floyd in particular. Quote, Floyd seemed as clean a fellow as I ever run into outside of his record. He treated me nicer than I ever expected. As far as being what they claim he is, I don't think he is. They talked fine to me and apologized for what they had done. They said they hated it worse than anything they ever had done, but in this case, they had to do it. I don't believe that they had anything to do with that Kansas City killing this morning. I think they are figuring on holing in for a while. Floyd, I saw right away, was a right nice fellow. He would kill a man, but not unless he had to. They told me I would be safe if I would direct them to safety. Floyd told me to take the golf bags he left in the car they abandoned at Bitzer's garage so I would have something to remember him by. I told him I wouldn't need anything to remember him. He ain't half as bad as people think. He's not a criminal killer. He acted like a gentleman if I ever saw one. End quote. A few months later, Adam was caught. Floyd was gunned down. Both were adamant they had absolutely nothing to do with the Kansas City Massacre. A lot of crime historians seem to agree. Floyd was always very honest with his family about things he had actually done. And he absolutely swore he had nothing to do with it. Unfortunately for Adam, Floyd was blamed for just about any crime that ever happened in the region. And by being associated with him, Rachetti was too. He died in the gas chamber after being convicted of killing those five police officers. I think he would have been luckier to have just been shot down like Floyd. The gas chamber is a horrible way to go. I've actually stood in the chamber in which he died. I don't know which chair, but it was one of these. He is said to have screamed in agony, according to witnesses. One of his final words were, I haven't done anything to deserve this. And if he didn't do the Kansas City Massacre... There's no evidence he ever killed anybody. Adam was treated horribly in prison. One time it was listed that he had fallen off of his bunk. In doing so, he hit his head seven times on the bars of his cell. Mm-hmm. Right. All of these beatings were trying to get him to confess to the Kansas City Massacre, which he never did. The abuse took its toll. Adam Rochetti was only 28 years old when he died. Yet, in this photograph, I think he looks 20 years older. He still managed to find a little joy while imprisoned. In the Johnson County Jail in Kansas City, which is where he was incarcerated most of the time, he drew on the wall of his cell, in pencil, realistic and beautiful murals. The staff would actually move him from one cell to another so that he could draw on the walls of a different cell. People who have seen it said he had realistic shading, that it was beautiful work, that he very well could have had a job as a graphic artist had he made better choices with his life. For many years, one drawing survived. They called it the Rachetti Girl. It was a woman in a bathing suit with long dark hair, drawn with beautiful detail and shading. Most of the shading was gone by the time it was documented, and all the other drawings were gone, destroyed by prisoners who were in those cells after him. But for a while, the sheriff said he wanted to preserve this drawing to show what Rachetti could have been. He had gifts that could have been used to better society, yet chose not to use them. Adam Rachetti was buried here in Bolivar, no one has bought any of the plots surrounding his grave, but there is one mystery associated with Adam Rochetti that to this day has never been solved. And as you can see, there's these 
these flowers here. And someone has left flowers on Adam Rochetti's grave since he died. It's a mystery because nobody really knows who's doing it. Now I'm actually traveling today with a gentleman who used to work at the cemetery and he was telling me that the woman that used to run the office here one day said she got really close to seeing who this woman was. It was around 1988 and so she was able to say it was a woman. She would have been working over here this direction behind where my car is right now As she saw that woman come to Rochetti's grave, which is right here, and leave the flowers, but she just missed getting close enough to really tell who it was. At this point, like it has to have switched over to somebody else. Like I said, that was in the late 80s. Here we are in 2023. It has to have passed down to somebody else. I cannot imagine the original person still doing it. So maybe it was a relative. Maybe at first it was his sister, a girlfriend, who knows? Nobody knows who the mystery woman is or was. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you are enjoying the content I make, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I can be found at Patreon slash Madam Morbid. You can find ad-free versions of current and future videos on there. I also place bonus content. For example, this week I will be placing a small video about the mausoleum from hell. One of the creepiest mausoleums I have ever come across when I'm in a cemetery. It was abandoned. It, it just looked like the set of a horror movie. So I'll put cool stuff I come across when I'm filming that doesn't really fit into any of the documentaries I'm making. All it is is $5 a month to access that extra stuff and videos that I think will get censored on YouTube. I will put the uncensored versions on there as well. So I hope to see you there. Right now I'm talking to an empty room. Hi mom. No, actually my mom's not on there either, but she's funded a lot of my trips. So if I have a patron, she's my biggest one. But hopefully some others of you will decide to join us. He only felt in danger. Baby, honey, I'm recording. I saw a rock. I, there are lots of rocks, baby. Stay by me. What, honey? I, I know you have a rock. Good job. What are you doing, Maggie? I don't know. Yeah, she doesn't know. I don't know what I'm doing. That's cool. That's a cool. Yeah, there's a car. Stay by me. Oh yeah, I want to go. Uh huh. Based on what he, based, yes, baby, view of them, that Maggie. Get over here. Get yeah, just stay by me, baby. Stay near me. Stay by me. He's just doing his rounds. I don't know. Oh, Maggie says she doesn't know. <laughs> stay by me.